Hi, I'm Nathan, and today we're going to be talking about how to play Soul. It occurs to me that some, if not all you viewing these videos, might not understand how the game actually functions. While it's obvious to me, as I created the game, it's understandable that other people without my inside knowledge wouldn't know. I was hesitant to make this video at first, because ultimately I'll be working on a new version of the game, but that might be a while off, so I think it's worth doing. Besides, I think it will help provide more context to the game's creation. This video will be divided up into two main sections, character creation and gameplay. So, let's start where a player would start, character creation. Let's start by creating a character together to help explain the process. The first thing a player does is to roll the stat dice. This determines the player's core stats, which ultimately affect a few different things. The core stats are strength, agility, endurance, and intelligence. The core stats allow for the player to gain traits, which we'll talk about later. They also allow for players to use certain items. This is due to some items having specific requirements. For instance, the civilian mining laser requires three endurance to wield, shown by this green icon here. The only way to gain additional stats after character creation is by rolling a 1 or 20 during gameplay. Upon making one of these rolls, you are granted the stat that best relates to this action you had performed. Anyway, our character. We rolled a 9 for strength, 3 for agility, 4 for endurance, and 3 for intelligence. Once a player has rolled the stat dice, they are usually either allowed to swap stats on any of their dice, or re-roll their lower ones. We are going to keep ours as is. From here, a player selects a race. Admittedly, I had plans to make a lot more races, but only actually finished two. The humans, and an alien race called the Biss. Humans have the unique ability to multi-class, meaning of the three abilities they can pick, they can take one ability from a class other than the one that they selected. Well, the Biss could pick an additional ability from the class that they selected. They also had bigger character tiles, but this was mostly for fun and didn't really have too much practical application. For our character, we're going to be boring and play as a plain old regular human. Once the race is selected, a player can select their subrace. Subraces primarily provide a stat boost, helping the player further tailor their character to what they want. Human subraces are typically based on their planet of origin and buff stats accordingly. Generally, they grant plus 5 additional points to a core stat, but there are a few that are a mixed bag. The Biss, on the other hand, have the Craftmaster and the Heartblind. The Craftmaster doubles the player's highest rolled stat, while the Heartblind triples their lowest rolled stat. Lastly, both races have a subrace called AI. The AI does not have their own physical body, and all core stats are combined and converted into intelligence. They were also only allowed to play as a computer specialist. Having chosen human, we're going to play as a Venarian from Venus, granting us plus 3 strength and plus 3 agility. After the race and subrace are chosen, a player can pick a class. As much as I'd love to go over each and every class, that would make this video way too long. Because of that, we're just going to go over quickly how to choose one. If you are interested in a video of all the classes, let me know and I'll consider making one. Picking a class itself boosts your core stats as well typically plus 5 of whatever core stat that fits the class's playstyle. Once a class is chosen, a player may only choose abilities from that class, unless they are human, which our character is, but we'll be going over that in a second. For our character, we're going to pick the Knight class, which works well with our high strength stat. After a class is chosen, a player will then pick abilities from that class. There are three main types of abilities. Active abilities are ones that players use that cost concentration. For instance, the robotics engineer could use Construct BattleBot, which creates a robot to help them fight. This ability costs 3 concentration to use. Let's explain concentration real quick. Concentration is a stat that can be thought of as a resource for players to spend in order to use their abilities. It has a fixed max number based on the subrace they chose along with their intelligence stat. As a player uses abilities, their current concentration goes down. Once a player is out, they must wait for their concentration to regenerate to use more abilities. If you play many video games, this is like mana essentially, just not for magical abilities. Next are passive abilities. These are abilities that are always in effect and do not require concentration. As an example, the Merchant's Loan ability allows you to use other players' items as long as they are 10 spaces away. Lastly are Toggle abilities. They are effectively passives that can either be turned on or off, or swap between two different states. For instance, the Nomad's Forceful Fist ability can either deal plus 2 damage or heal 2 when they attack. For our character, I'm going to pick Chivalry, which lets us rush to an ally's aid when they are attacked, granting plus 3 armor before taking the damage for our ally. 
To combo with that, I'm going to take parry, which upon being attacked with a melee weapon, we can counter the attack with our own melee weapon. This allows us to defend and punish the enemies after attacking our allies. Now for my third ability, I could choose another one from the knight class, but because I'm human, I can multi-class, so I'm going to pick an ability from another class. I decided on the bartender's open tab ability. This allows us to absorb all damage taken in a turn, and then release that damage onto a single target the next turn. This should work really well paired with chivalry. Now that I have my class and sub race, we should have everything that is going to add to our core stats. I get an additional 5 strength from my class, and an additional 3 strength and agility from my sub race, giving me a total of 17 strength, 6 agility, 4 endurance, and 3 intelligence. Now that we have all that totaled up, we can pick our traits. Traits are cards that provide bonuses to a character, allowing you to diversify them further. There are four main trait types, one for each core stat, along with having five subcategories for each. Might, Precision, Fortitude, Vigor, and Focus, each providing benefits to a specific play style. New traits are unlocked for every five points of a core stat a player has. A player can only have one trait of each stat type. However, upon gaining more stat points, a player can choose from a more powerful one higher up the ladder. For instance, a player with 5 strength could choose an effect like Tough to gain plus 5 stamina, or Aggressive to gain plus 1 melee damage. Once a player has gained 10 total strength, they could pick something like Boisterous, allowing them to deal 1 damage to all enemies around a target. For our character, we have 17 strength, so we can pick anything from at or below tier 3. I'm going to go with Angry. After performing a successful attack, you may basic attack for half weapon damage. This will work pretty well with our parry ability to further punish our enemies. I also have 6 agility, so I can pick from the first tier of agility traits. I'm going to be going with Nimble, which allows me to not be hit by attack rolls of 8 or lower, giving me some extra protection. Unfortunately, my endurance and intelligence are too low to grab a trait for either. Once a player has chosen their traits, they are given an amount of money determined by the Game Master. Then, they choose their items. There are six main types of items. Wares, which typically provide some sort of defensive effect, like armor, shields, or evade. Ranged weapons, which are basically different types of guns. Melee weapons, these are swords, knives, fist weapons, etc. Medical instruments, which typically provide healing or concentration regen. Things like scalpels, defibrillators, bone saws. Consumables, these are one-use items such as bandages, grenades, ammo, robots, or even alcohol. And lastly are trinkets. These generally change an ability a character has completely. For instance, the Refraction Field Generator allows the Assassin's Visibility skill to create a 3x3 field, allowing allies nearby to become invisible as well. Let's say I've been allotted $2,500. I'm going to go ahead and start by grabbing some armor. Plate Mail seems like a good choice, as it grants me an additional damage, along with some extra armor after attacking, which should work well with my parry ability. Next, for weapons, I'm going to grab a Gladius for some damage, and a Buckler to gain a little extra armor. With my last bit of money, I'm going to buy a first aid kit to help me stay alive. Once a player has chosen these items, they add all their cards to their hand. They will then name and create a backstory for their character. Let's say we name our character, um, uh, um... Crod. Yeah, Crod. He was born on Venus, as part of one of the largest mining families on the planet. However, Crod saw a lot of injustice in his family's company, and would often stand up against his family's actions. Eventually, because of this, he was disowned from his family and found himself homeless. He ended up making a living for himself as a bouncer at a bar. However, he still wanted to make something of his life. That's when he found the Knight Program for the United Confederation of Soul the governing force of the solar system. It played to his protective nature and made him feel like he was doing something greater with his life. Despite that, one day he hopes to return home and end the injustices his family has been able to get away with for far too long. So, we have our character made, and now it's time to play. So, how do you do that? Well, for anyone who hasn't played a role-playing game before, there are actually two types of players. One type we just explained during character creation. It's known as a player character. The other is the Game Master. This is called other things in different systems, like Dungeon Master and Dungeons and Dragons, but the idea is always the same. This player controls the game, NPCs, or non-player characters, and weaves the narrative for the other players. Think of the Game Master kind of like the narrator of a story, while the player characters are the main characters. Now let's talk about the gameplay itself. In Soul, there are two different game states, roleplay and combat. 
During roleplay, players will go around within the world that the game master creates for them, interacting with NPCs and solving puzzles and mysteries. This can be anything from sneaking into a warehouse to steal a spaceship part for a client, to searching a cave that has been giving off strange readings on your scanners, or even something as simple as having a drink with your group in a space station's lounge. When a player runs into any sort of challenge, the player may be asked to roll a 20-sided die to resolve the conflict. Rolling high typically means success, and rolling low means something usually goes wrong. Let's say our boy Crod is aboard the UCSS Texas, a spaceship in the United Confederation of Souls fleet. They received a distress signal from a nomadic group of space travelers, who are being attacked by space pirates. When the UCS ship shows up, the pirates are scared off, and they provide help for the damaged nomad ship. Crod talks with a young woman named Olive, who explains they are traveling in search of the light, a source of enlightenment prophesized in her religion. When suddenly, the pirates return, now with reinforcements, as they crash into the ship and start boarding. Combat begins. In combat, a player will typically start to use their abilities and items more often, and the rules become more strict as to what a player can do. Players take their turn based on what character has the highest agility stat. On a player's turn, they can move or perform an action. Movement is simple. A player may move a number of spaces up to their maximum movement per turn. Typically, this is determined by the subrace and the traits that they picked. Crowd is a Venarian, which grants him five spaces of movement and has no additional modifiers. Let's say in this scenario, he moves five spaces to get closer to a pirate who's boarding the ship. Actions are a little more complex, as it can be a lot of different things. The simplest thing would be for a player to use an item, such as one of their weapons or healing tools. Now that Crod has closed the gap, he is going to use a melee attack with his Gladius. The GM has determined that as long as Crod rolls above an 8, he will hit the target. He does and hits the pirate, dealing 4 damage with his weapon and additional damage due to his armor, for a total of 5. Because Crod has the angry trait, he can attack again. If he hits, he will deal half damage rounding down. Another option is for a player to use an ability. A player will read one of their cards in their hand to use. For instance, Crod can use his open tab ability, assuming he has the 12 concentration required to use it. The card can then be used again on his next turn, assuming he has enough concentration. Some abilities do have restrictions on number of uses, however, such as the officer's space bombardment, which can only be used once per session. Lastly, a player can use an action that is not part of their cards like picking something up off the ground or tackling another character. Anything is possible, but the difficulty will be determined by the Game Master, requiring a player to roll high for challenging tasks or low for simple ones. For instance, Crod could use his action to attempt to close the airlock, preventing more pirates from entering the ship. Players also have a reaction, which they can use when it is another player's turn or an NPC's turn. This allows them to interrupt the other character's action with their ability. An interrupt ability is indicated by this red exclamation mark. On the pirate's turn, Crod sees another pirate attacking Olive. He uses the Chivalry ability, allowing him to jump to Olive's aid and take the attack for her. Because he is hit, he also activates his Parry ability, and he can make an attack on the pirate as well. After the player's turn, the Game Master used the NPCs to fight the players. The most important stat here is the player's stamina. If a player reaches zero stamina, they'll fall unconscious and are unable to perform actions. If they fall to the negative of their maximum stamina, the character will die. Assuming they don't die, once a player has either subdued, killed, or talked their way out of combat, the GM may award some loot, depending on what the Game Master wants. They can either award something specific, or use the loot dice we made to give something random. This will typically depend on the game or story the GM is trying to craft. Crod, the other knights, and marines of the UCS fend off the pirates and save the nomad ship from certain doom. Olive gives Crod a set of nomadic fists, a traditional weapon of the nomads, and thanks him for protecting them. Crowd goes back to the UCSS Texas and goes off to find their next mission. So that's the basics of the game. Hopefully it gives you a better idea of how all of it works, but if there's something you don't understand, please leave a comment and I'll do my best to explain it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.